now and have uh, Dr. Liu Elias. We look to have him weighed in and let's review those papers together with his insights. Uh, good morning to you, Dr. Liu Elias. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you join us on the show. A happy Independence Day to you and a happy new month. Same here. Now, one of the first issues in the news is President Bola Metinibu's comments during his statewide broadcast yesterday on intentions to convene a 30-day confab where youths would have the opportunity to prefer recommendations. Now, the National Youth Council of Nigeria has commended this initiative, but MBF is of the opinion that this would not be sitting on the right foundation if we do not go back and adopt recommendations made at the 2014 National Confab. In light of this, what would be your recommendations? Is it applause for President Tinibu's decision, or much like the MBF, to revisit the past and begin our implementation from recommendations made back in 2014? Right. Uh, I think I listened with ardent attention to President Bola Ametinibu yesterday while he was giving the uh, uh, first October uh, messages. Now, the fact remains that I think it's a good one, is a, a political score for President Bola Ametinibu because you recall that uh, we have had bad, bad governance in recent, we have uh, uh, NSAS, recent, uh, fearless October, among other challenges. And you agree with me that uh, it's, uh, it's as if that the future, the future of the youth is so, so challenging. I think it's a good one. The other thing is that it should not be politically uh, politically uh, motivated. It should be more more intentional. Because if you look at what he said, he said it's going to cover security, uh, innovation, employment opportunity. You know, something that will chart a better way forward for Nigeria. I think it's a good one for for Nigeria. But the only thing is that who represents the youth? That's the question now. Are they going to be people that are governor nominated, or are they going to go to real youth organization to pick this uh, representative to really discuss uh, these uh, uh, issues as it's supposed to be? Now, talking about the political score, a, a lot of persons are also looking at it from that angle that uh, uh, particularly the People's Democratic Party, the PDP, has said that it is mere rhetorics, much like a tradition for every president leading Independence Day celebrations to make this rhetorics. But having looked at President Bola Metinibu's administration in the last 16 months, would you say that there has been an actual dedication towards listening to youth concerns and many people continue to point to the fact that a lot of our appointees in his cabinet are young persons. Do you think that this uh, sort of speaks for itself, or much like the opposition is saying, it's merely a tradition? Right. Uh, without uh, missing words, I think uh, this administration has actually considered the youth. To an extent, you have really mentioned where we have a uh, minister of youth, youth. Uh, we have had our other appointee to be youth, and we have also seen more influx of youth in the program. Perhaps they also introduced a student loan scheme, you know, and it's for, for the youth as well. So bringing up this as well shows that he has a good uh, intention for, for the youth. And for me, anything that will make youth to come together to discuss, to chart the way forward, to create employment opportunity, innovation, you know, to really give us future, I think it's a good one. So for me, I think it's a good uh, administrative and political score for Bola Mertinubu to have think through this way because I can tell you, without such intervention, we could have unrest. That's that the youth are unemployed, the youth don't know that. So uh, for me, I think it's a good one uh, in a good direction. Then uh, people are talking about the past one. I agree with them. You know, you recall that uh, we have confab, nothing has come out of it. The also had its own, nothing has come out of it. But I know this one is going to be what the youth really, really want. And, you know, because we are youth, there's a way we actually want to fight for uh, what we think we deserve. So I think uh, President Bola Metinubu is putting himself uh, forward to actually do what youth are actually expected. So let's all see it happening first before we now see the implementation. Now, now many persons talk about government being a continuum. Many are asking the question of, is there continuity if we do not start from the basis under the President Goodluck Jonathan administration where plenty of persons came together to make recommendations. How are we not sure that after the President Bola Metinibu era, the next government would not convene another confab on what he thinks is the most genuine concern of the people it's governing? Do you think that the government of the day, in sincerity of purpose, would follow through to avoid such assertions and insinuations? 
Right. You know that President Bola Ahmed will be just 16 months in the office, so there is a chance for him. You still have two budgets that you can actually implement all the decisions or some of the decisions. No, you cannot stop other government from also coming up with their own. Depends on what is the problem at the particular time. I think what we should do, we should look at National Assembly because National Assembly are supposed to dust uh, the confab report and adopt what they're supposed to to adopt because it's like, like it's too for a uh, national assembly you know president cannot uh, uh, literally, literally implement those decisions it has to go to the state assembly national assembly and do pick from it so by the time the youth come together and prefer solution it may not be a document for only the federal government even the states can look into it and say okay you say you need a uh, technology hub in every state okay my state will are going to implement that you said you need uh, uh maybe 10 percent affirmation my state will adopt. So it's not a function of even the federal government only. It will open another vista uh, for the entire country on a way forward. And you will agree with me that the people that can actually drive the economy are the youth. And remember, the youth are, are hopefully the leaders of tomorrow. So if they bring up an idea, they may also want to see it through when they are in power. Now, now moving to another prominent issue in the news this morning is the reactions that have continued to trail most of the comments made by President Bola Metinibu in his speech yesterday. Now, and beyond which is also some of the opinions ADB and TV sampled across major cities in Nigeria, particularly from the angle of what the government is doing to alleviate the plight of Nigerians. We looked at how much was earmarked for the CNG buses. A few given to labor and student unions. We also hear that 20,000 tricycles are also going to be distributed. Are you satisfied with the level of progress in achieving the Presidential Compressed Natural Gas Initiative? Right. I think uh, that question is very, very instructive. I can tell you that I'm not satisfied in terms of because I'm a living experience for that. I've been trying to convert my car for the past two months. I've been told there is going to be 730,000. I'm actually waiting for them to send a SMS to me so that I can embark on it. And I've been trying all possible means. I've visited about three conversion centers. We are still having issues because of uh, manpower and unavailability of uh, uh, tools or kits, rather. Then in terms of uh, President uh, Bola Mertinu promises, I don't like it when the president comes out and promise what they cannot fulfill. I think president should be presidential in terms of uh, making sure they achieve what they mentioned. When President Bola Ahmed Tinubu removed first subsidy, he said point blank that he's going to uh, provide 3,000 CNG buses. And you could only see that they only said there are 64 buses, which will be shared between uh, labor and uh, student union. It's quite laughable. You could also remember that when he removed the first subsidy, he never looked at the uh, negative externality that could come alongside his decisions. In a, 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 like these uh, issues. Now, the CNG people cannot convert with ease. You know, there's a serious bottleneck there. The availability of buses are not there. He also give the 10 billion naira to each state's governors to provide CNG buses. He's not following it up to see it uh, to fruition. This is three months. If you're importing a, a, a bus from anywhere in the world, three months by now, you should have it. So it's a serious issue. And yesterday, I must tell you, I was a bit uh, disappointed in this uh, because I expect some points for him to have mentioned that will solve and elevate our suffering. But he did not mention it. So for me, I don't think there's a good uh, uh, disposition. You could also recall one year ago, one year, two months, because it was July 13 last year that he said, there's going to be food, it is declared state of emergency on food security. And the only problem we have in food security is the issue of supply chain, which amounts to the transportation. I was thinking by now, you would have designed a kind of a pattern that will make it easy for people to move our food item from one place to the other. So for CNG, I think we are just, uh, you know, we are just still at the same level. I can't, I can tell you that we cannot look say one percent of cars in Nigeria has been converted, which is quite sad. More so that we are even interested in converting. Now, many look at the number sixty-four, Nigeria at sixty-four. Do you think it was meant to be more like a, a milestone pegging that sixty-four CNG buses that were dispersed? in an anniversary that marks our 64th independence, other than thinking about the number of Nigerians who rely on mass transport to be able to carry out their livelihoods? That is quite uh, contradicting now. How can you say because we are 64 
And will he say because we are 64, he will now announce 64 minister? Will he say we are 64, he will now do a lot of things that has to do with 64? This is much more challenging. He should ask, he should, he should not like 64,000, not 64. <laughs> so he could also learn 64,000 now. It's, it's possible. You know, that's what we are. I think it's a serious issue. We shouldn't even uh, try to make it uh, the uh, uh, not something. Uh, don't let us uh, make it something that is not serious. It's a serious uh, issue that I need to take charge of. Why will you launch 64 when you promised 3,000? Well, it's a big call, 64,000. And I'm thinking that particularly with the 774 local government structure, that would be a good number to address it. But let's also pick on our third issue in the news this morning. A lot of Nigerians following the outcome of the hashtag end bad governance protests were looking at the hashtag fearless in October protests with keen eyes. Now, and whilst there was a low turnout of protesters across major cities in Nigeria, there were some incidences of tear gas being used to dispel protesters. Let's get your thoughts on what you think in some states might have marred the turnout of protesters. As against some displays we saw in Lagos, which are said to be politically motivated by the likes of Sure. Right. I, I think um, the protest was well uh, announced that there will be fearless October. And because of that, police uh, take to street, especially in Abuja, and making sure that it does not actually happen. But it was uh, it's, it's, it was successful in uh, Lagos or Shun, among other, other states. But I think uh, we should come to terms in this government that our uh, protest is one of our rights and they should be allowed to protest because you know this is a good protest i would say that and it's i can't say i can't I will not even agree that it's politically motivated because our uh, politically motivated and serious protests will not have a date will not have a time it will just be spontaneous here and there but then they are so uh uh we like to say kind to this president that we don't even experience that and those that want to uh, actually carry out the protest they announced it and even the leader so they led the in Lagos. So that simply means that they are actually plan uh, what they actually want to do. But we, uh, we want to encourage the uh, security agency, especially the Nigerian police, to make it not worse because, you know, the, their disposition also matter at this point in time. If you if we are protesting and you are giving them serious, uh, uh, you know, uh, fights, it's, it's also lead to another thing. But if they are protesting, make sure you guide them alongside the protest. That really makes more sense compared to trying to harass them, trying to intimidate them, trying to push them out of the protest. I think we should be much more uh, civil and democratic in, uh, in doing things in Nigeria. Now, th there's still some protesters reportedly incarcerated following their participation in street processions despite court orders re restricting protests to certain venues in states. Now, on that part, human rights activists have talked about the fact that it is a constitutional right. Now, whilst we see this arrest in some cases, tear gas being used, uh, many still ask the question of if indeed we are practicing a democracy. Uh, do you think that these are some of the attributes as to why persons question the sort of democracy Nigeria is practicing? Right. To actually make sure or you gag or make sure that people are confined in a particular area is undemocratic and it doesn't really follow what guide protest. Protest, uh, protest, protest can happen any day, any time, and everyone has a right to protest. So for you to uh, guide them to a particular place, it's a serious issue. Perhaps, I think that's guiding of uh, uh, people, or maybe make sure people are remaining in one particular place. It was for, I mean, and bad governance. I don't think there's a court order for a uh, fearless uh, uh, October. More so, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's quite challenging sometimes. It's not people that those that actually enjoy and protest to the extent that it's even bring them to governance are uh, actually now stopping people from from protesting it is what we need to speak on because if you think it's not affecting you now tomorrow it may actually affect you and you need to protest and you also be said no you cannot move everywhere this is where you are supposed to be i think there should be freedom to actually uh protest any day anytime now another issue in the news and this one has to do from the economic perspective the LCCI has made recommendations calling on Nigeria to diversify its sources of revenue to curb an overdependence on our oil. What do you make of this, especially noting that we're not meeting our OPEC quota, our uh, production targets continues to decline, crude oil theft has been blamed on it. How valuable are these recommendations coming in from the LCII 
at this point in time? Uh, quite uh, valid. You recall that successive uh, administration have been talking about diversification, and I can score President uh, Mohammed Buhari to an extent because you know he, what he did in uh, agriculture, especially rice. You could see that we are able to be self-sufficient to an extent. Then we talk about local rice now. He has been able to diversify to an extent. I was afraid this president also to key in with that diversify. Because if you don't diversify, it becomes a serious problem. You are going to be that. Let's even leave the language of diversification. Why not make sure we face what employing Nigeria more, which is agriculture? So if you can face our agriculture sector very well, which employ about over 50% 50 of Nigerians, you know, and we have not even tapped into the value chain because the value chain is so enormous that we need to look into and actually work on. So I think it's good we diversify. That, is, that would have bring reduced pressure on, uh, uh, you know, uh, oil and gas, you know, the, our export. Because now all our income is 95% from, uh, from oil and gas. And we must do something because if you look at even the word oil and gas now globally, it's getting literally to uh, people are challenging it gradually. You know, we have seen... Uh, electric uh, vehicle, we have seen on uh, alternative uh, source of energy, a lot of things are coming up. So I think it's right time for, for us to diversify. If we make sure we face our agriculture, fix our manufacturing sector, you know, this would have helped to actually uh, diversify our economy. I think we should be intentional. About, and that's why I have issue with this uh, government in terms of uh, their blueprints to actually develop the Nigeria economy. You know, some company, some government, government will come on board and say, Okay, this is our short-term plan, medium-term plan, and long-term plan. These are aimed to diversify the economy so that the private sector, the state government, we can all key into it. And by key into it, we we'll make sure that we we'll achieve that uh, aim of diversifying the economy. But on the, uh, on, uh, but contrary to that, we only see that these governments are much more proactive, uh, reactive when they, uh, there's an issue. They quickly find solution to it. Meanwhile, they're supposed to be proactive to plan so that when you plan for your economy, you can easily guide it towards, uh, you know, your plan and people will support you in achieving it. For me, I don't think there's anything bad if we start from now and said we want to have social tones of uh, 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 maybe ginger, maybe of cassava, maybe of this as we have in rice. Because of that, we can actually now put some, uh, uh, some uh, intentional, you know, policies that will make sure that we actually diversify. I think that's what we must start to look at critically. Now, now, some of the challenges with the telltale signs that the world is fast migrating towards clean and renewable energy is the fact that some oil majors in Nigeria are also selling off some of their shares and stakes and more like moving out of the country gradually. What would you say, in your opinion, is happening in our oil exploration sector that is forcing this trend of many oil majors pulling out of that sector of the economy. Right, so you agree with me that most of these companies are very vast in research. They research even 10 years ahead of what is likely going to happen. So they are foreseeing a lot of things. Perhaps our, our the Nigerian economy is not even encouraging. So sometimes they like to be where they will not have issues of this uh, dollar naira issues. So I think they have seen the hands that in future, maybe there is going to be serious diversification. So because of that, Shell, among others, are thinking about moving to the other cleaner energy, you know, to make sure that they are into the to the business. And that's quite uh, uh, worrying, because worrisome, because if the global community are moving away from oil and we are still there, it's a problem. We are supposed to be in tandem with what the world is saying. Though we, we, from the way I see things, I think oil is, good to, is still going to be with us. Uh, for the next 30 years, but what happened after 30 years? And that's why this confab that is coming is another thing for Nigeria to enjoy diversification. Because if you have seen that way, we also need to move core into technology. It's a good thing. Look at Indian. Uh, as at 20, 30 years back, you see Indians moving out of the out of the country, out of their country to other country. And they now do diaspora remittance. So if our uh, people are also Japa. And it could also be converted to economic advantage. The Japan, and you find a way that they should also have a remittance into Nigeria. So we must find a way to diversify. However, those international. Now, it may seem as though we lost connection with Dr. Aliu uh, Elias there. Are moving out of here. I think the connection is getting better now. Doctor, just reiterate the last point you are looking to make for a minute. We lost you. 
Right. I would, I'm, I'm trying to just analyze that uh, it's quite uh, important if we can make sure that uh, we also follow the trend and make sure that we don't get caught, you know, by surprise by the global community cutting away from the uh, oil and gas. We must also follow the trend and make sure that we keep tab. If we are doing electric, if they are on electric uh, vehicle, let us also join them. Perhaps, I think in the next 30 years, we will still remain uh, in a, uh, oil will still be valid in the next 30 years. But that's Now, with these your projections value. that we might still have oil in the next 30 years, we're also looking at uh, the report is issued by the Nigerian Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative that uh, told us that on an average, 1.34 trillion Naira is lost annually owing to oil theft. They were also recommending that we have a tracker system that can monitor the oil wells in the Niger Delta and even when they are transported across the country from point of lifting to point of uh, drop-off, we can be able to monitor this. Now, do you think that well, this is indeed a step that can curb the large-scale industrial theft of our natural resource? You know, when you, you recall that when President Bola Mechimibu came into power alongside the Emile Kiari, there was a serious uh, effort in curbing oil theft in Niger Delta. And it, in fact, they employed Tompolo, among others, to actually guide it. I was thinking to make a very meaningful one because we all need, in Nigeria today, we need to increase our oil production. That is what, because like your, in your analysis, we are not meeting OPEC uh, quarter demand let alone dangote demand so when you meet open demand that you are going to meet uh, dangote demand so for me i think we need to do more to reduce oil theft and corruption alongside our oil sector it's very very uh, important there's also the issue of uh, amounts owed uh, according to the nnpc over 2.8 trillion naira what happens to this backlog a backlog that is still being owed uh, how can the marketers on one hand and even the federation accounts get the monies accruing to it you recall that NNPC immediately came out and said they are not owing. It's just a business transaction where you get uh, an item and you pay back uh, later. I think that's what they are trying to say. But uh, owing in business sometimes is not a bad thing if you can have your plan on how to actually uh, pay, pay, pay back. Because if you have a credit world, if you are credit worthy, uh, it's not bad to actually owe. But the thing is, that's why we must make sure that our refinery works. If our refinery works, it will be our oil. It will be our refined product, it will be our sales, and we'll be consuming it domestically. And that's why we must also support Dangote to actually be effective. I'm sure today, October 2nd, uh, from yesterday, October 1, they said they're going to be supplying Dangote in Naira. And that's what we are expecting. So we are going to be expecting a better uh, price uh, for Nigeria. Because if we don't take control of this sector, if we don't have the right, you know, we are rent seeking as at before now, before we now have done with it, we are hoping that we also have a, a Nigeria refinery working. If we continue to be rent seeker, we'll just be seen and will not benefit from the oil and gas. And as it lasts, uh, we need to benefit uh, benefit from it. In terms of uh, NAITI, I think NAITI is doing a good job to have bring it. It's a government agency that is also bringing out such a, uh, well, such a uh, information that is quite alarming out that we have to be careful in terms of a level of oil theft. But I think uh, President Bola Metinubu and Miliki have sustained their efforts when they uh, came early and in, in the first six months, the way they are trying to fight oil theft. If not, we are going to be at the uh, receiving, end, receiving end. Now, I'm talking about divestment in the oil and gas industry. We continue to talk about how much of uh, gas we have in Nigeria untapped projections that we have between over 102.3 trillion cubic feet of gas on tapped and uh, it almost feels as though we continue to flare this gas going forward many look at the provisions in the PIA act for uh, a maximum of 10 years tax holiday for investments in gas despite these provisions what in your opinion would you say is deterring foreign direct investments in divesting our gas resources Right. Let's uh, first and foremost let me talk to you about the advantage. If you go to organize a country, let me use that language. You know, gas are being piped to people's home, whereby you just open it like the way you open tap. You use it; it should be pay as you go. You know, but in Nigeria, upon that we have it in abundance, it's just flaring away. But now that we are also trying to convert, I can tell you that most people are actually converted their gas. I mean, they are vehicle to to gas. I also queue. Having queue, that's our fear. I spoke with a taxi man 
I told him, Oga, why have you not converted your car to CNG? Ah, my brother, Nigeria is a dangerous country. By the time everybody opened their eyes and moving to gas, it will become like petroleum where we have to kill two, three days to buy it again. You know, it's sad that even a common man could also reason to that uh, aspect. So I think, and for uh, pouring a uh, for, for PFDI to come into gas, it's not easy the way you mention it because. First and foremost, you know, they will look at the challenges of the Nigeria economy. Inflation at about 32 uh, uh, percent, you know, you see a lot of insecurity, a lot of things are discouraging this international uh, community from coming to invest. Because you have, when you want to invest, you look at a lot of indices, look at a lot of things, and you project for 20 years. You know, when you invest, you may not gain your money in the next five years. So you look at what happened after 10 years. Is there going to be, you know, uh, policy somersault? Is there going to be, you know, are you going to have stability in the policy? A lot of things that I need to perhaps we are supposed to encourage the indigenous company that will have confidence in our country to invest but the problem is that where do you want them to get the fund they should go to the bank where they will get uh interest at 35 percent who will go there to, to 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 get fund these are the problems surrounding investment in that but i think government should take the lead by taking the lead i i, I saw yesterday that there is a license for is it five indigenous company to start, uh, you know, producing uh, gas, and I, it was so beautiful when I saw them getting it. But the thing is, they are getting the certificate. Are they also having access to the fund? That is a problem. Now, moving away from gas, another way we can diversify economy. Many continue to look at our tax uh, generation, but the challenge here is foregone tax or into tax holidays and actual uh, revenue collected. Once you look at this across board, be it uh, custom duty tax and the other types of tax we have in the country, why is there this still huge disparity in foregone tax and actual collected revenue? Well, one of the best things that this president has actually embarked on is to institute a committee on tax and fiscal policy. I think it's a very good task. I still listened to some of their uh, plan yesterday. You know, if we can have that implemented, because we are still using about 1960, you know, Act or uh, that, we, that we have, if we can actually move towards them, uh, uh, Taiwo Yudili led committee uh, proposes to be a good thing for uh, small businesses and the multiple multiplication of tax, tax from local government, state, and multiplicity rather will not be will not be there again because you know they want to collect, they want to say that okay, we will collect 95 percent of VAT and also. I mean, we'll collect 100%, give 95% to state and take 5%. That would have guide it. So I think the uh, what they are bringing, I, according to them, one of the uh, policy will be gazetted, gazetted today. And we are hoping that the National Assembly today, today, tomorrow, will also start reviewing the uh, re review and repeal new uh, views that will help uh, taxation in Nigeria. The only challenge they have is that they will actually want to move that from 7.5 to 10%. As well, but they said if you are MSME that is doing below 50 million or so, you may not be in that. Uh, uh, in that, uh, you know, will be excluded in some uh, taxation. I think we must get our poly fiscal policy right because if we get it right to attract small businesses, you recall that small scale will have to in in, in future move to a large scale. So if you protect the small scale, large scale businesses, I think with a lot of uh, our policy direction, that would have been be good because I can tell you most businesses so far double taxation in Nigeria. Now, now there's a part of tax we don't talk about too often, particularly with the concern on our states of our road infrastructure. There is a provision for the road infrastructure tax credit scheme. But uh, often at times, when we talk about the lack of road constructions or repair across major roads, the east-west road, we're looking at new road contracts, uh, contracts like the coastal highway, whilst we have trunk A roads that are supposed to be servicing Nigeria, why do you think that most times the government does not make for this provision to address our current road challenges? Well, I think we have a Federal Road Maintenance Agency, uh, FEMA, but the only thing is that according to um, the Minister of Works, uh, he said they, are, they only have 13 billion. So when you have 13 billion to repair Nigerian road, it becomes a serious uh, question. Now, can that even fix only two state road? But the question, the, the joy is that according to the minister David Umahi, he said they are going to toll a lot of road, Makwadi Road, East West Road. Most road they are fixing, they said they are going to toll it. So by the time they toll it, 
I'm expecting them that they'll be raising some money from uh, that road uh, that will go into into repair because there's need for repair. But beyond repair too, we need to work on our roads, our infrastructure. We must not build infrastructure that will last for 10 years at this age. It should be at least 50 years before we can even think of uh, major maintenance, which is very, very key. So I think with tolling of the uh, most of those roads, we can have more money to fix those roads if it does not go into corruption again. Now, now, Dr. Ali, who help us and our viewers especially understand this concept of independent revenue uh, based on the concept of having government-owned enterprises. Now, despite years of investments in government-owned enterprises to generate independent revenue, the issue of the single treasury account in collecting this revenue continues to draw some lacuna for corruption to thrive in those enterprises. How can the government achieve this? use of the TSA and recoup its investments in surplus invested in its own enterprises. Right. You know, that's part of our expectation when the president said he's going to have a, a minister, I mean, SP on administration who will, who will focus on the key performance indicator of ministers. Remember all these MD, all, all these MDAs, uh, all these uh, agencies are under a minister. So sometimes I think we have to change our, our pattern by giving them some level of targets that in your administration, these are what we want you to actually work on so that you can really measure them alongside. TSA has come to solve a lot of problems if we actually maximize it. And I think it's been relaxed during this uh, President Bola Mitsulubu. You recall that most people even carry their carry out contracts. You don't get paid by the ministry, you get paid directly by uh, CBN. You know, there's a way you do everything goes into the uh, uh, TSA, which is a good one. So I think we just have to uphold it more and make sure that uh, every income actually come into the uh, TSA before it can actually go out. You know, before now, the ministries, the agencies can actually make their money, you know, and when they make their money, they will not be the one to remit to government. But now everything should come to government. If it comes to government, from that, you now propose what you need to collect and government will now give you that back. But you can't put an NPC in that. I think they are special agency. You also recall that it is called NNPCL, among others. Now, so I think we need to make sure that the TST will work more. Now, I heard you mention about the role of ministers in ensuring this transparency, and I'm wondering uh, how about the Fiscal Responsibility Commission as empowered by the Fiscal Responsibility Act? Uh, is there room for synergy between the ministers and the commission? Well, I, I think uh, that's another thing. You remember, even fiscal, fiscal Responsibility Commission is on that somewhere. <laughs> but the thing is, they are supposed to monitor how much comes in, how much goes out, just like the way I mean. You know, you must, uh, you know, it was 5% condition that you must actually make, you know, I uh, will not collect more than, you know, of what you make earlier before. So sometimes it has to be stringent, you know, when you are trying to open it and make it easy for them to do it. Become, and that's what we suffered during uh, President Mohamed Buhari. They want to make the law easy for president and easy for some agency, but it must be as it's supposed to be. They must return it as supposed to be. So you must make make sure you make a particular amount and get less, some percentage of what you make. It makes them to work or to work more. So I think uh, the Fiscal Responsibility Commission needs to work more in terms of even our budget. And our, our budget, you know, because when they are bringing their proposal, you have to look at what they actually brought and against what they're actually asking uh, for. But we need to just do more. But I can call this a precedent. I think if there's anything he knows how to do very well, he knows how to collect money from people very well. And it's they can testify to it more money through uh, our fiscal approach, which is a, a custom. You know, our custom is even becoming a revenue uh, based, not fiscal responsibility, because sometimes it's not about money, it's about how to use it to control the economy as well. But if you see a uh, first of the removal, if you see Nera floating, it brings more income to the to the coffer of the federal federal government. So I think that in terms of revenue, they are doing well. The only thing that has been eroded by also the same floating of Nera. Now let's also talk about some other ambiguities in following the money as it concerns uh, citizens who are looking to ensure there is transparency, transparency and accountability in the process it is the concept of statutory transfers. Usually, they are appropriated and presented to the public in bulk sums. Many civil society organizations continue to ask, why can't we have detailed breakdown 
of what this statutory transfers to the National Assembly, the National Judiciary Council, the Niger Delta Commission, uh, and the likes who enjoy this statutory transfer. Do you think that if we have this detailed breakdown, our quest to being more transparent and accountable would be seen by all Nigerians? Right. Ideally, transparency brings accountability. It is what you see that you can follow. You know, that's what we call follow the money. It is where you see it, you can actually follow where it is expending for, what is expending. I think there's nothing should be eating. Uh, but, but you could see even from President Bola Metinubu, the transparency is not as expected. If you could just uh, purchase a yacht before you bring it to the up, if you could purchase an L, uh, aircraft before we get to know, you know if you could buy a bag before we get to know, that means it's not following the appropriation as expected and the same thing is happening but we need to do more and that's why we have to hold our national assembly accountable because their job is to do oversight led by uh, uh god's will Pabio. they need to do more in terms of uh oversight and as a, as a civil society organization too we need to find a way to get that uh, uh details and that's why we always say well done Sarah, because i think they are doing more in terms of uh, doing those uh, basic research even budget is also doing more, but we all need to come on board to make sure uh, we do more to make sure that government is accountable. Now, the National Council on Public Procurement is supposed to have an arm owing to the National Procurement Act of 2007, but it almost feels as though that inter ally use of having a, a portal on which the bidding process and contracting award for public procurement is supposed to be done has been somewhat neglected. Uh, what do you think are some of the challenges hampering that? and giving room for corruption in public procurement. Right. I think, uh, you know, when you look at the uh, Bureau of Public Procurement or Procurement Council, I think they actually, if you ask me, they actually doing well because you recall that what brought about them was a serious issue because of the poor procurement processes in terms of the abandoned uh, projects, in terms of uh, bad appropriation, in terms of uh, uh, not utilizing donor money are uh, very well but the, the the fact just remains that you know there's what we call letter letter of no objection so most of them they go back to them and say okay we need the letter of no objection because of a b uh, and c however they need to be transparent more because if they if if they are transparent in that in their own area it will make uh the society or nigerians to have much more added in terms of uh, in terms of projects and that's why during you recall during the president Bola, uh, Muhammad Buhari, all the projects that we have ongoing by President Jonathan, we want to make sure that he actually achieves, and that's one of his uh, political scores, to make sure that he's actually achieved, uh, finished those, some of those uh, uh, projects. But in terms of transparency, we just have to continue to hammer on transparency. You recall that even the Federal Executive Council, some of their, uh, uh, some of their approvers are supposed to also go to uh, a particular uh, council ahead of that, supposed to be maybe former chief judge, former head of the board, they never organized that. Even President uh, uh, Obasan Joe, Yara Dua, all the past president never instituted that. So those are the things we still have challenged. But in terms of uh, uh, looking into what people are appropriating, I think Nigerians should do more by having interest in every uh, appropriation. Now, another issue that continues to raise concern is diaspora remittances. Whilst we're looking to diversify options of increasing the country's revenue, we continue to see the humongous amounts that are published as diaspora remittances. But in terms of its use in government, most Nigerians still do are yet to understand how it betters the lots of the country. Could you help us shed more light on that? When they say diaspora remittance, it does not really mean that it comes to government coffer. You know, me and you can have an uh, uncle uh, in uh, one of those countries that will be sending money to us. But it's only that governments take account of it and by so doing they can say these are what we actually have but that, that's why remittance is expected to uh make, make our forex you know better in terms of we have much more uh dollar in uh, our set and it's also help the uh, foreign reserve these are the benefits of the diaspora uh remittance. and that's, that's part of the instruments that is supposed to be used by cbn to actually control this uh, uh forex problem I, I can tell you that major problem of nigeria is forex issue if you look at even the trouble we are having in oil and gas it's forex problem if you look at our inflation that we are actually having can be also attributed to forex problem so if you can solve that forex problem to an extent that would have solved our 
issue. So diaspora remittance, like I said earlier, these are what some other countries are benefiting. You know, they have accounts and details of all the citizens that travel out, and they have a way of making sure that they actually return to uh, things to the to the to the uh, their main country. And that's what Indian has actually practices. You know, you see them everywhere in the world, and by so doing, they are actually bringing something back to their country. So we need to do more to expand the diaspora remittance. Now, I'm talking about uh, foreign exchange. The other day, in a private chat between yourself and I, we're looking at something you called a policy somersault. And it's from the angle of approach of our Apex Bank, the CBN, in addressing this exchange gap. The current administration chose to float the Naira, remove the exchange rate cap, but it almost seems as though, despite interventions to selected BDCs, the gap between the Naira and the dollar closes in some months and in other months just continues to widen. Take, for instance, in the last few days, it's on the average 1,650 naira to a dollar. Now, how do we achieve this much softer stability of the naira uh, with the approach the CBN is taking? Do you foresee any respite in the coming weeks? Right. Uh, so far, if you ask me, I think the uh, Yemi Kadoso led CBN has not got it right in terms of uh, forex. Uh, and reason being that you could see that he has turned out over 40 policy framework to actually bring about a solution to this and he has not got it uh, has got it right and it's a factor of uh, a floating of naira because when you there is no country in the world i can tell you that will leave the you know that to the uh willing buyer a uh, willing seller and you could see them coming back again to actually give money to uh sell dollar to bdc that shows that there's a serious policy uh, some and sort. I think we need to also guide it. Let me give you a good example. Look at Dangote refinery. So if Dangote is getting a particular, uh, when he's getting a window to assess his uh, dollars to actually uh, produce as it were, it will also it will reflect in how much he's going to sell and to reflect how much the consumer are going to buy it. That would have solved our problem. So there should be selected areas in which government will have interest in terms of providing forex. You cannot leave it all out because you have floated the Naira and you have also removed for a subsidy. You are supposed to take one day, two variables together is what is bringing us this problem. But for me, I think government should go back to manage the floating of Naira. Well, I must thank you, Dr. Aliu Elias, for sharing your perspective. It almost feels as though we've largely discussed issues of the economy as it should be, occasioned by the 